Hi, this is Carla, and welcome back to There Might Be Cupcakes, episode 52, Everything That Was Hidden Has Now Surfaced. This episode is a special interview before the follow-up second episode about Dario Argento's Three Mothers series and the Suspiria remake. I am working on that now, and I have been, but I didn't want to hold on to this interview for the case of proper ordering and being a stickler and all that stuff. This interview is with my friend and the horror author, Mike Bakoven. Mike is the author of the domestic werewolf horror novel. <laughs> Let's try that again. I'm leaving that in. Domestic werewolf horror novel. Pack. And the highly original and not to be pigeonholed horror novel Fantastic Land. Fantastic Land was my introduction to Mike and his work before I ever be even became his friend. It was blowing up the horror discussion groups I belonged to. One of my friends that I mentioned in the interview, hi Jenny, I believe brought it up first. She had read it already twice and was prolestatizing it to everyone who would listen, was having nightmares about it, was making lists of her dream movie cast members, you name it. And everyone in our groups who listened to Jenny and started to read Fantastic Land were popping back into the discussion groups and sharing that they too were obsessed and were having bad dreams and casting their dream movies already, you name it. Fantastic Land was Mike's first novel, and it's written in the style of interviews after event. It will totally be your jam if you love both horror and true crime, because these interviews are trying to suss out what happened and who did what after a horrific event. Now, for spoilers. Mike and I do freely discuss both books, but we of course do not reveal the ending. We do obliquely refer to it when it comes to Fantastic Land, but we do not spoil it. We mention character names, and we refer to a couple of plot points about which fans have questions, but these plot points are not spoiled. However, if you are one of those people who like to go into a book blind, please do save this episode until you read Fantastic Land. I'll understand. <laughs> you should be perfectly cool for Pac. This warning generally goes for this podcast. I discuss things with the understanding that I'm discussing something with you guys that you've watched or read, but I'm never going to flat out just gnaw on the book or movie's ending either, unless saying so beforehand. I love both of these novels. Mike is skilled in world building, so both of these novels have a distinct voice and feel, and both are a whole lot of immersive fun. And immersive is the right word, because in both... The story is about being trapped in one way or another, trapped in time and place, trapped in Cherry, Nebraska, trapped by a Florida hurricane, trapped in a theme park, trapped by a ticking clock, trapped by weaponry, trapped by roadblocks, trapped by human vices, trapped by biology. So, here's Mike and me talking about his work and horror movies and other horror authors we both dig and horror novels he's going to write. Oh, yeah. We drop right in giggling about how the Skype ringtone reminds us of the unfriended horror movies and discussing Midsummer because I came directly from seeing it to interview him. I will attempt to link to everything we reference in the website entry for this episode. There's links to Mike's books and his website in the show notes, as well as his social media links. I hope you enjoy. We enjoyed it. We plan to talk again on the podcast. I hope he and I have brought you cupcakes, and I will see you very soon on episode 53 with the second episode on the Three Mothers movies and the symbolism within and the Suspiria remake. After the interview, I will read the official synopses for both novels for you. The links to purchase both are in the show notes. And a little note on the background noises. <laughs> I recorded this interview over Skype in a Starbucks. <laughs> As I've mentioned in past in, uh, episodes, I live up on a mountain at the edge of the George Washington National Forest along the Appalachian Trail, which means we have satellite internet. I do not trust it for something as special as this interview. So therefore, at points during our talk, you're going to hear a little background chatter and general barista coffee noises. I do apologize. They do not drown either of us out. Think of them as Virginian ambiance. A little extra gift for me to you. <laughs> and yes, I deliberately included the old school Skype ringtone on purpose as a nod to the unfriended and fr uh, unfriended dark web horror movies. 
which begin our conversation. Again, I hope you enjoy We Enjoyed. And that Skype sound reminds me of the movie Unfriended, so it's a little creepy. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen that one. It's yeah, that was a that was an interesting idea. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which is a good way to start a conversation with a horror movie. <laughs> awesome. Well, pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for taking the time. Sure. Thank you. Sorry, I'm a little late. No, don't worry about it. Midsummer was uh, was worth it. I think. Yes, it was. Did you know that the director's cut is three hours and forty minutes long? Oh man, yeah. I, I it was it was fine the length it was. <laughs> yeah, oh, I, I, I I am now afraid of flowers. Yeah. <laughs> See, I'm I'm of the impression that uh, the Good Place is one of the best things happening right now in art in general. And was really uh, uh, jazzed to see William Jackson Harper do anything. And then, of course, <laughs> what happened to him in that movie was just terrible. Yeah, bless his heart. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> so, well, real quick, I understand you have wiener dogs. Yes, I do. I have, um, I've always had a wiener dog ever since I was born. Um, my current one is a Double Dapple, short hair. Uh, her name is Ellie. Oh, that's great. I've got... I've got a, uh, a black and tan right now named Marlo Aww. and a, a beagle wiener dog mix named Sherlock. It's ironic. He's the dumbest dog you've ever met in your life. <laughs> oh, 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 that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. My, my wife and I have had wiener dogs for years, so it's, that's, that's cool. It's good to meet another wiener person. Yeah. Yeah, we rescued Ellie, and uh, unfortunately, when we got her, um, she had been named for Ellie Mae on the Beverly Hillbillies. Oh, geez. So, Ellie May, she remained. <laughs> uh, I can think of worse names. Yeah, true. <laughs> so, how do you pronounce your last name, Mike? Uh, I'm I'm not terribly particular, but it's Bakoven. Bakoven, okay. Yeah, so you take you take a shot. I'm happy with it. Okay, okay. I was close. I was really close. Yeah. I uh, I work at a at a museum. I'm the marketing director for a museum in in the town that I live in. And uh, as my as my day job. And the other day I was doing a radio interview and this guy said, how do you pronounce your name? And I said, Bachoven. And he goes, OK, I think I got it. Gets on there and he goes, we're here with Mike Bukoven and just totally butchered the whole thing. <laughs> just tell people to think like Beethoven. It's like yeah, Beethoven. yeah. He gave it. He Bacoven. gave it a good shot. I'm happy. Oh, yeah. Bless his heart. All right. <laughs> I wanted to ask about PAC because. Yes. To my lazy eye. On the cover, it looks like the title is Pack, but on Amazon, it says it's a pack. Really? Yeah. Huh. It's, it's, I haven't run into that yet. Yeah, it's Pack on Goodreads, um, but it's a pack on Amazon. So huh. it's just Pack, right? Yeah, yeah, okay. that's correct. Just Pack, yeah. All right. So it, you're... It, was, it was originally envisioned, and, and I had a, uh, a plan for if it took off to do a, a four book series, and each one would have been a different. Uh, one syllable p word oh, but cool. uh, di didn't look that doesn't look like that's going to pan out at this point so i think it should personally well, and and to refute your downing of it i looked at the scores on goodreads and 84 percent of people liked it as of last well, that's night. good yeah it's three four cool. and fives 84 percent so yeah i'll take that yeah the, so, the, se the second one's done so <laughs> excellent because i'm loving it i'm about 75 percent done and i love it so well, thank you. I appreciate that. And Fantastic Land is spelled with a capital L, correct? It's correct. Fantastic okay. Land. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So if you could just briefly tell my listeners about your books, because we're just yeah, rattling on like they know. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely. No. Okay. Fantastic Land was released in October of 2016, and the elevator pitch to it, or the favorite way I've ever heard it described mm. is... Uh, off-brand Disney plus climate change plus Lord of the Ring or plus uh, Lord of the Flies equals the business. I like that was it. the uh, <laughs> that was the best description I heard. Uh, the 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 log line is that a a group of uh, of uh, basically teenagers and college students who are working at a theme park get trapped by a hurricane that uh, was bigger than anyone thought it would be. And there's a lot of backstory as to uh, how this you know uh, hurricane happened and how the park came about. But they get trapped there is the point. And when they're rescued 
six weeks later, they find that uh, really, really bad things have happened. So that that's kind of the, the gist, and it's told kind of in a World War Z style. I don't mind saying that I, you know, stole pretty liberally from uh, from a couple sources, and one of them was World War Z. Mm-hmm. So you kind of get the story unfolding as it uh, as it goes. You're you're kind of presented with the carnage at the very beginning, and then it, the story kind of peels itself away until you figure out. Uh, uh, who you want to believe or not, which is kind of the thing I'm I'm most proud of, and then yeah. Pack, which was, re- and then Pack, which was released about a year ago, a year ago in July, is uh, my my take on the Great American Werewolf novel. It's set in Nebraska, where I'm from and where I currently live, oh. and is uh, yeah. And the way I describe it is, it's a, uh, a family falling apart who happen to be werewolves. Yes. Yeah. So. <laughs> Yep, and uh, I'm hearing this week whether or not my third book is, is uh, going to go or not, so I've kind of got my fingers crossed. Oh, that's fabulous. Well, like I said, the, the scores are excellent. 84% of people like Pack, 94% like Fantastic Land. So, yeah, the reviews for Fantastic Land have been embarrassingly, embarrassingly good. Uh, I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I, I'm really happy with how, how the, that's been received. I have a friend, I'm going to shout her out, Jenny who has read Fantastic Land, I think, three times. She said it's been happily ruining her life since last year. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. I yeah. That. <laughs> she said it's been giving her the best bad dreams. <laughs> oh, that's good. I will take it. I will take it. And the, the fun bit, too, is that I've had people... Uh, messaging me with theories I've gotten fan uh, I, I got a, a piece of fan uh, art or I've gotten a couple pieces of fan art Whoa. and I got uh, some fan fiction uh, cool. about six months ago you know someone who uh, thought they had figured out who the warthogs were and kind of wrote it out as if that would happen it's like man I love that that's that's far and away better than than I thought what would happen so I'm I'm just thrilled to get all of it oh that has to be so flattering it really is oh, I mean, wow. like beyond beyond what I was hoping for and we talked about this, but you know, when I asked for questions, the biggest question was about the warthogs. Yeah, let's get into it. Yeah. So, what about the warthogs, Mike? <laughs> All right. So, what about the warthogs? What I've been telling people is the warthogs have been bugging me a lot lately, and I might have to do something about that here pretty soon. Um, I did not, when I wrote, uh, when I was writing Fantastic Land, I'm a mm-hmm. discovery writer. Mm-hmm. So, I didn't uh, map it out. I didn't plan it out. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the bits of my writing process that, uh, is, was a little weird is I've always heard people say, don't talk about your stuff while you're doing it. Just do the work. Right. Don't, don't give away your, your buzz from creativity. I kind of did the opposite. I had a friend who I was kind of pumping chapters to, and she was uh, really instrumental in saying, oh, this is good. Maybe you want to go a different direction here. We kind of edited it as we went which was really nice as a discovery writer. So you don't get at the end and then have this giant mess that you have to clean up. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. And as my first book, it, it, uh, you know, I, th- I think was able to, to, I was able to kind of make that work, but who are the warthogs? Um, I didn't, I, I, I have my idea. Mm-hmm. I've had, uh, uh, some people who have some other ideas and there are a few breadcrumbs in there, but there's not like a, a you know, you don't need a codex. You don't need a, uh, you know, the, the first letter of every paragraph is not, you know, <laughs> is not, not a hint. Um, it, it's, it's something I'm still kind of figuring out, and, and I have a pretty good idea. But right now I'm basking in the idea that uh, it's better in everybody else's head. Yeah. Because whatever, whatever I come up with isn't going to be as good as what's in your head right now. I'm yeah. Sure. Yeah. To me, the hotel sequence with the warthogs was probably one of the most horrifying of the book thank you I I like that chapter yeah just just the idea of that that these two people went here's our chance you know we've always wanted to do this we might have been doing this at home we might have been fledgling serial killers let's rock you know that's just horrifying you know game on yeah yeah Yeah. (laughs) um yeah. I had uh, I had one by I'll go ahead and I, I don't want to spoil it. No, but I had one yeah. person write and say uh, was the head of the freaks uh, really doing those things and then covering it up and was he really controlling the warthogs and all that sort of thing and I'm yeah. like no I think the freaks for what you saw what you see is what you get you know they were they were puffing out their plumage and they were being uh, being as big as they could and trying to scare people away. Yeah, uh, the warthogs are their own thing. I think I can give that away. Yeah, that's what I that's what I thought. I thought the freaks were kind of a Marilyn Manson thing. Like, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Actually, this is really funny. The um, I, I don't know if you've ever seen the the makeup show Face Off on the Sci Fi Channel. Mm-hmm. 
mm-hmm. one of their judges, Glenn Hetrick. Yeah. That's, that's kind of who I based the, the character, the lead of the freaks on. Oh, that's and great. The, yeah. And the guy who did the audiobook picked up on that and totally did a Glenn Hetrick voice. We had not communicated at all. <laughs> and he figured it out and, uh, or at least get, got my intent and totally did a Glenn Hetrick voice. So if I ever meet that dude, I'm going to be like, yeah, I've got some serendipity that happened around, uh, around your persona on TV. Oh, that's beautiful. That's yeah, great. it was fun. <laughs> Yeah, and the other, the immediate questions I got when I put it out there was, Mike, the postcards, man. I mean, <laughs> they couldn't even articulate the full sentence. It was just, Mike, the postcards. You know, the postcards. You have to tell us the postcards, man. The postcards are, pl- like, I, like I said, I'm a discovery writer, so I've got yeah. notes here and I've got notes there and I've got yeah. chapters here and there. Yeah, the postcards come back into play. Uh, the idea that you can go only get them in one place. And, uh, I, man, I don't want to give away the story, but, yeah, they were they were only in that hotel and they keep sending them to Jason. Yeah, that's that's fun. I, that's, uh, I, I was... You know, I, I maybe felt good about myself for a second uh, after coming up with that and then, then knock it off pretty quick. <laughs> so is there going to be a Fantastic Land sequel? I am kicking around ideas. Um, oh, yeah. The, right now, and I don't mind telling people this, this is, this is kind of fun. Uh, it's in, uh, it's not quite, in, it's in the stage before in development. Basically, the um, it's been optioned and the gentleman who... Uh, by Hollywood, the gentleman who bought the, or who is kind of optioning the rights to the book is, uh, Andrew Dabb, the guy who runs the TV show Supernatural. Nice. Yeah. And oh. he's had, he's had the rights for, for a while now, for about 18 months. Uh-huh. And, uh, um, it's kind of been bouncing around a little bit and he thinks, thinks he has a place for it. And then, of course, all the writers in Hollywood, uh, uh, fire their agents and kind of go on a little bit of a strike. Of course. So. Of course. So I'm. Uh, uh, we've got until the end of the year, and maybe maybe something will happen. And I would love to uh, love to see that. And then at that point, you know, while we were having those negotiations, he goes, "What sort of uh, sequel ideas do you have?" And I go, "Okay, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I got ideas. Yeah, there are the warthogs. I've got uh, I've got a story kind of percolating about what happens to the park after uh, after it's reopened. Uh-huh. Uh, I've got a, a bit about what happens to." Um, uh, to the leader of the pirates because he's in jail and yeah. there are some people who want to break him out and some people who want to put him underground and yeah. maybe they meet in, meet in the middle of you know a situation and then um, I've got more Hurricane Sadie stories. Yeah. The 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 thing I kind of liked about Fantastic Land, if I can do you know toot my own horn, is the the idea that isolation breeds different things, just heightens things, right? And so these people are isolated; they can't escape. And fear kind of took over was kind of what I was hoping to hoping to get out with Fantastic Land. I've got an idea of a story about what happens when tribalism takes over. You mm-hmm. know, what would happen if, you know, one person could, or one group controlled all the resources and talked themselves into, you know, the, the idea that we don't need to help anybody else. We can just keep to ourselves and do our own thing and God put us in charge or whatever else, you know, mm-hmm. we're just going to see how that goes. And I've been trying to crack that story for a long time and... Maybe getting there, maybe not. You know, it's it's a uh, it's a process. I've got a lot of a lot of different things that are that are a quarter finished. Yeah. Do you kind of see isolation like intoxication? Like it brings out, you know, a heightened version of the real self. I think so. My yeah. My mom always told me that uh, uh, integrity is what happens when no one's looking. Yeah. And I love the idea that when no one's looking, and you inject something like fear, or you inject something like tribalism or desperation or whatever that people just lose their minds i love that i yeah. love that idea just as a horror story you know just people act, acting in completely bizarre and antithetical ways because uh because nobody's watching because there are no consequences and like what happens when someone says or, or someone points out to someone else you can literally do anything you want nothing is going to matter here you know what happens then what does integrity look like then you know mm-hmm. so so yeah, I do. I do like that concept. Yeah. Do you think there's a possibility that the new uh, merged from the ashes Fantastic Land could be haunted from all the stuff that's happened there? Ooh, that's interesting. <laughs> I, I think I think when you're talking about haunting at that point, I think the, the the ripples of what happened in Fantastic Land are going to go and go and go. Yeah. And one of the things I kind of have been digging on just narratively in terms of what I'm what I'm trying to write is 
that nobody really knows the story. I mean, you've got yeah. all these different stories, but you have to kind of figure out what the truth is. Mm-hmm. And so what if, you know, what if the guy in the hotel is, you know, uh, lying about why he was there? What if the, you know, the freaks were actually doing things? You know, what if things were a whole lot worse or a whole lot better than they were made out to be, you mm-hmm. know, or a combination of both? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, uh, haunting is fun. Um, the the book I'm kind of waiting on right now is, is more of a ghost story. So I've been cool. playing with that too. But yeah, Haunted cool. Fantastic Land would be a blast. Yeah, or just the idea of just a ruined place, you know, just... I, I call um, my favorite genre of horror demented domiciles. Just, you know, where a place is just wrong. Yeah. You know, like Ann River sit on the house next door. You know, it's not mm-hmm. a haunted house, but it's wrong. And it taints yeah. what's there. So just the idea of Fantastic Land just being a huge demented domicile. Just, <laughs> it's just that, wrong. <laughs> that people try to put a happy sheen over the top of. That exactly. Could be a lot of fun. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. I like that. Do you, do you ever read? Uh, do you ever read Jeff Strand? Any of his books? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just uh, finished a couple of months ago. Finished uh, uh, the Haunted Forest tour, and it took some weird turns. But like the first half of that book, kind of it, what you were saying, kind of reminded me of that. Just like, just there's there's something terrible with sharp teeth and red eyes around every corner, and there's yeah. nothing you can do about it. You know? Yeah. Oh, I'll have to read that one. Yeah, just a wrong place. I love yeah, and stuff. then it, it gets super weird toward the end. It, it, and I say that as a compliment. as like nothing but... <laughs> oh, I'll have to read that, definitely. That goes on the yeah. list. <laughs> yeah, nothing but good to say about Jeff Strand. I, I met him on Twitter a while back, and it's like, yeah, I, I, that dude is prolific. Well, he and I are actually, uh, for full transparency, friends on Facebook. So if you would like really? an introduction, yes. Yeah, I'll well, tell happy. him he's got a fan in Nebraska. Absolutely. Well, uh, the one other question, and again, it comes from Jenny. Hi, Jenny. Sure. Um, <laughs> is Brock's interview, the last interview from Brock, he, yes. he laid down some serious accusations about Sam. And Yeah, she, he did. Yeah, and she wanted to know what was up with that. She said it, it, it felt like it came from left field, and because of that, she felt like it was real. Like, you know, because it just came from left field, that it felt like, well, he must be telling the truth or there's something mm-hmm. behind this, that there's stuff that we didn't know about Sam. Yeah. With, without trying to make it sound like a, you know, a JJ Abrams puzzle box, you know, yeah. go that route. But um, yeah, I think the, the bit that I've been thinking about most just as a writer and as, as the, you know, in a world building sense is like what happened in the tunnels. Yeah. You know, the, the first, the first, uh, while they're waiting out the hurricane. Yeah. Uh, while some kids were just sitting there playing cards were, uh, were really bad things happening behind doors. Yeah. Uh, I think the answer is yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and I think, you know, the idea that, that Brock was kind of triggered by, uh, you know, the institution not being, be able to do something simple, like getting, getting an asthma inhaler to his brother, yeah. you know, is, uh, uh, powerful to me, but maybe not enough to throw someone completely over the edge. You know, maybe there was some other stuff. So I would say it's, I, I don't want to take away whatever it is you took from the book, right? I don't want to say this is the way it is, you know, but exactly. and, and as the, as the person who wrote it, I'm, I'm definitive because I love hearing what people come up with. Mm-hmm. But, uh, um, uh, yeah, I would say, I would say Brock maybe, maybe has has a has a point if not t- is if he's not telling the exact truth he might have a point. yeah yeah all right what would you do if you were there would you um, have I, hightailed it through the water and gotten out i would have suffered and died would have been my guess i'm <laughs> i'm a, uh I'm, I'm a i'm yeah I'm a lover, not a fighter at best, you know, and uh, it, it would not have gone well for me. Um, I've got, uh, when I when I was talking to, to Andrew about it, it's like, listen, if you want to put me as a cameo in the movie, I'll be a corpse face down in the water because that's where I think I'd end up, you know, or, uh, or that guy that falls off the roof at the very beginning if I'm feeling particularly... Um, you know, particularly uh, excited that day or whatever, but but yeah, I don't think things are gonna gonna go real well for me in my personal life uh, yeah. uh, once I get into Fantastic Land. Um, the I, I I love the uh, what you know what tribe would you end up in though you know what yeah. would happen um, and and what would what would you do? Um, I I think the idea of 
the Deadpools is interesting to me, but man, they just got hammered as it kept going. You know, the idea that uh, it's just a loose conglomeration of people getting together, recognize there's, you know, a bully, you know, or two around the corner and just trying to get strength in numbers. And then it kind of snowballs as, you know, more and more gangs develop. Um, I could see myself staying in a group like that way too long too, you know, and, and, and just ending up with an arrow or, you know, something bad happening to me. Yeah. I can see myself wanting to walk through the water. Just like, yeah. okay, you're all crazy. Um, I'll take an alligator. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and if you, yeah, the, the most, a lot of people are like, oh, it's not realistic. There wouldn't be uh, uh, violence that fast. It's like the thing I think most is most unrealistic about the book is nobody hightailed it for the hotel faster. You know, yeah. it's like, you're not the only guy. There would have been dozens of people in the hotel. It's like, I don't know. I don't know. Well, people are pretty prone to inertia people will stay put that's true people people are prone to inertia and people are lazy frankly people will stay put until you tell them to move (laughs) i think you nailed it (laughs) well thank you well and i don't know if you've ever been in a flood but flood water is not pleasant i mean you you know you, you see all those those really happy uh photos online of people in canoes paddling around you know their front lawn and that sort of thing it's like dude that smells terrible i've been in that sort of stuff it is not fun no it's it's everything that was ever under and it's now over and there's a metaphor there maybe i don't know yeah there you go (laughs) i'm gonna take that that's david lynchy and i like that yeah there you go I'll, I'll be in the back of the next book, and thanks to Carla Huffstead there. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> we, well, have, speaking of Lynch, I have to ask you about influences on Fantastic Land. I mean, do you love books and movies like The Hunger Games and Battle Royale and Mira Grant's new Flesh series? Yeah. Um, my tastes run... Uh, I've, ever since I, I put the book out, I've been reading a lot more horror, which is good, but I've kept uh, for years on a strict uh, fiction, nonfiction diet. So I read a lot of uh, uh, read a lot of nonfiction and a lot of fiction. Mm-hmm. Um, and I wish my tastes were more eclectic than, the, um, you know, than, it, than uh, you know, your average person. But it's really not. I mean, you know, the, my benchmarks are a lot of people's. Mm-hmm. Uh, wor- you know, World War Z was pretty amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, I've read a bunch of Stephen King. I've read a bunch of Clive Barker. Um, um, you know, when it comes to, you know, horrors and thrillers, you know, I, I've got, I'm a big Joe R. Lansdale fan. Yeah. Um, yeah, that definitely. dude, oh my God, that dude, he, he's, uh, um, you know, I, I'm a big fan of his. And then, uh, for the past, I'm going to say maybe 20 years or so, I've been diving real big into, into, uh, older horror movies, B movies, uh, things along those lines. So I've got a group of friends on the internet where I go to, uh, where I'll travel to, you know, to Pennsylvania or to Chicago and go to all night, you know, movie, uh, monster movie festivals or oh, all cool. night horror movie festivals. And cool. Yeah. So I've got, uh, you know, me and, me and some of my friends here in Nebraska have some internet friends and we will go to the drive in all night or we will, there's a thing in Chicago called B Fest, which I swear to you is 24 hours of bad movies. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Friday starting at five, ending at Saturday at five. And, uh, I have seen some stuff there, you know, <laughs> that sort of thing. But it's, you know, it's a bonding thing, but also, when you when you see something like uh, oh I don't know when you see the abominable Doctor Fibes and you realize oh my God Saw owes everything to this movie or yeah. you know when you, when yeah. you go back and see Last Man on Earth and and it's your favorite of the three you know times they adapted that you know that book yeah. it's you know you you, you kind of develop maybe a little bit of an outer taste so that that's kind of where I come from yeah have you ever seen or read Battle Royale? I'm yes, absolutely. Yeah. I have absolutely seen and absolutely read Battle Royale. <laughs> yeah, it may, yeah, it may, it may have shown a little bit. I don't know. Yeah, um, watching it, it was like it had. I don't know if you agree with me. It had the weirdest, kookiest moments, and then it had the creepiest moments. Yes, absolutely. There were, yeah, there are some images in that movie that will stick with you long after you're gone. Yeah, uh, that, yeah, yes. Battle Royale is, is a really powerful piece of exploitation cinema, and it's easy to dismiss it because it's so exploitive, but yeah. the, some of the stuff they have in there is just really, really good. Yeah, that one girl that is actually a psychopath. Yeah. There's a really good actress. She was amazing. 
but then some of it is almost slapstick. And it's like, what, what am I watching? <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it's weird. That's the thing. As, a, as someone who's gotten into B-movies, that's the thing that I love is when you see something absolutely brilliant in the middle of just a sea of crap. You know, it's like, <laughs> oh, this movie is terrible. It's like, oh, wait a second. What are they doing? That's yeah, well, really interesting. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I love when that happens. It's one of my favorite things. Yeah. Well, I have to ask, do you really, do you believe that something like this could happen with teenagers left alone? The, uh, the, the short answer is yes. Yeah. Um, when it's like, I've had, uh, a few people email me or, or, you know, leave reviews or whatnot to say, this is unrealistic. It couldn't happen so fast. And my response to that, not that I need to respond to critics or feel inclined to respond to critics, but yeah. my, my answer to that is the Stanford prison experiment, you know? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the idea that once, once the parameters are set and you know, you can do, you know, certain levels of violence or exploitation or whatever, then it happens at blinding speed. I mean, you know, they shut down the Stanford prison experiment after what, like 19 hours? Exactly. Something like that. Yeah. Planned on going for six days and they shut it down after one because everyone is like, oh, this is the game? All right, game on. Exactly. And, uh, and the Stanley Milgram experiment. Yeah. Yeah, that one too. Exactly. Yeah. So I don't, it, I think it could happen. I, it, to be honest with you, I, I think you can, you can t- sense in the book one of my uh, uh, anxieties, especially as someone who has uh, a couple kids, is climate change. Yeah. Um, that is absolutely terrifying to me. Yeah. Um, the idea that as populations grow and resources shrink, what are we looking at here? You exactly. know what I mean? How, how are we not going to erupt into massive violence? And then you go online for 10 minutes and you read some of the comments of your local newspaper, your local news source, and everyone's like, I'm going to kill you. You know, it, it's worse and worse. Exactly. How are, you know, so when people say this couldn't happen, I'm like, are, are you, lo- are you looking around? And that's not to say I want violence. It's the last, you know, I'm not mm-hmm. a, you know, I'm not, um, coming at you with an Alex Jones yeah. Infowars sort of thing, you know, exactly. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm I, I believe humanity can, can solve its problems and that people, uh, you know, people are amazing in the individual and you get them together and, and sometimes just really terrible things can happen. Yeah. And, and I think what's interesting with Fantastic Land is in some ways, Sam being an adult, being a young adult was in some ways a lot worse than the teenagers were. Mm-hmm. He yeah. lost. He lost it immediately. Yep. The second he was in charge, he was already not in charge. Yeah. It's, yeah. They took time, and he he, you know, he may or may not have hurt that girl. You know, mm-hmm. he immediately lost control. You know, and yep. he and he was the adult. So I found that really interesting psychologically. Yeah. Well, this, well I, I think the second the, there's a group of people, and I, I, I bet you've had these people in your life, and I've had them in mine. Is where the very second they can exploit you or hurt you, hurt you they're gonna. You yeah. know what I mean? Yes, and I have. It, it's good. To, it's good to keep an eye on those people. Mm-hmm. You know? Yep. <laughs> Be it an office atmosphere or you know whatever, wherever you see them, you know, it's like you just keep keep an eye on some of those people and and uh, keep close to the to the rails, and things should be okay. Yeah, definitely. And don't go in a room alone with them. How about that? Exactly. <laughs> yes. Especially in the dark. <laughs> I like that one too. Did you have nightmares when you were writing or even, you know, I was going to say outlining, but you pants it, uh, especially vivid scenes? Not really. Um, I'm not really a... Uh, a, a nightmare is so much type of uh, type of guy. I don't have a whole lot of um, a whole lot of nightmares, but mm-hmm. the I, I do have a whole lot of like it, basically the the way I work, you know, just creatively is like grabbing a whole bunch of different things and smashing them together and see if they fit. Yeah. Um. That my my thing that I do is that sometimes uh, sometimes when I have you know have a moment, I'll get on a treadmill and listen to music and just stare at a wall. Oh, and wow. what that does is kind of kind of force creativity a little bit because you're trying to distract yourself from how much pain you're in, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and um, that's kind of how how like the ideas start, you know, mm-hmm. is just finding some things and, and smashing them together and seeing if they fit. And then once it gets going, I've consumed a lot of media. You know, yeah. I've watched a lot of movies. <laughs> I've yeah. read a lot of books. You know, um, it, 
you can kind of take and, and steal things, or if a, if a really good idea presents itself, you can kind of run with it. But I, I tend not to take it uh, take it home with me when you know I, I've. I read one review where they said I wouldn't want to be in a dark alley with Mike Bakov. And it's like, I, I'm, I'm a nice guy. I'm not going to, I'm not going to hurt nobody. You know? yeah. <laughs> it's like, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, uh, after I'm done today, I'm going to go to a softball game for my kid. You know, I mean, it's, it's that kind of thing. Yeah. It's the, so it's the people that don't write about it. That you need to worry about it. You know? Yeah. 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 I think everybody does it their own way. You know, yeah. everyone has, has their own thing, but I was lucky enough to, to kind of have a, uh, have a couple things fit together. I think they fit together pretty, pretty well, and then then just kind of go with it. So I, I consider myself really lucky. I got it done. Yeah. Has Fantastic Land made going to crowded areas and amusement parks that kind of thing peculiar experience for you now? <laughs> oh, you know the part of the idea, part of the impetus for the book was a trip to Disney. Mm-hmm. We went to Disney World with my family, and and I found myself looking around, going, "Huh, how could this go wrong?" <laughs> you know. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, so that was, that was part of it. But yeah, we've been to, yeah, I went, I went down to, to California about a year ago and we went to Disneyland after Fantastic Land had come out and that was, uh, that was fun. The other bit is that I found out that there's a group of people, do you, are you familiar with Celebration Florida? That sounds vaguely familiar. Yeah. Okay. It's a town that Disney owns and operates. Oh. So the Disney Corporation owns and operates this town. And I had a woman write me and say that it was kind of like the uh, the book contraband book club for their town was to read Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> so so it's like Levitt Town, but by Disney. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I like that. Oh, that's creepy. <laughs> Yeah, it is creepy. And Fantastic Land is laid out like the Magic Kingdom. I mean, I don't think I tried to hide it too hard. But, you know. No, you didn't. Yeah, because they had the big hat in the middle, and I just turned it into an exclamation point and then blew it up. So. <laughs> so I have to ask for each book. Um, all right, so Pat, what's, yes. your, what's your favorite werewolf movie? Do you have one? My favorite? Yeah, and it's problematic. My favorite is American Werewolf in London, and it's uh-huh. problematic because John Landis is not a good person. But I, I, I am a fan of that uh, Shaun of the Dead, American Werewolf in London uh-huh. horror comedy sort of thing. Yeah. And it's rare when they come along and they're really good, and when they're really good, they're really good. <laughs> and uh, it was one of the first uh, horror movies I ever saw, like when I was like 11, 12 years old, mm-hmm. and the bit with the the people who had been ripped up in the movie theater just tormenting our hero trying to get him to, to go kill himself yeah yeah his best <laughs> friend with me oh man yeah. his best friend following him around yeah mine is the ginger snaps trilogy oh yeah yeah i love ginger snaps those those are those are interesting yeah what, what, what makes those your favorite um i just love how it ties the werewolf transformation with women's hormones and oh, getting, yeah. getting your period for the first time and going through all that. Just, mm-hmm. I mean, the scene her mother makes her a happy first period cake. That is just <laughs> horrific. <laughs> That's cool. But I just love the, the packs with the sisters and their, their really demented sense of style and how that transforms as, you know, the older sister becomes a werewolf. and just It just has a really interesting feel to it. And then the the prequel they did, where it's like they have ancestors that yeah yeah that was a fascinating movie that was really creative. So it just it's something I'd never seen before, you know. And it's 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 woman driven too, which is really yeah, nice. Yeah, yep, I really like that too. Yeah. The uh, the spark for Pack came when I was at a uh, I was at a hotel in the middle of nowhere and if you've been to nebraska they're just vast empty stretches of plains mm-hmm. and uh you know farmland and i went out back to this hotel and there's just a chair pointed at the at the woods behind the hotel oh boy and i'm like why so someone was just sitting in the chair looking at the woods I'm like what were they looking at so there you go that was that was like the impetus that was the the very beginning spark oh, of it I oh that's that much. great that's great yeah, that would creep me out too. <laughs> yeah, there's probably just some somebody smoking a cigarette and staring into the you know into the middle distance, but uh, or but yeah, just, just maybe like, not. <laughs> where did that come from? What are you looking at? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and of course, for Fantastic Land, that have to ask, what's your favorite? I guess slasher movie. I mean, you can broaden that as far as you want, but man, 
Yeah. Favorite slap. Okay. Let's, let's figure it out. Um, I should have these answers kind of down by rope by now because I, <laughs> it's like when I was like young, when I was like 13, 14, I was a big Freddy Krueger guy, but then you grow up and you watch those again. And you're like, well, they're creative, but man, some of this isn't good. You know? Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. Uh, and, and then you bounce around a lot. Um, I, I uh, have recently been watching uh, uh, some Giallo films, you know, kind of kind of doing a, a little bit of, um, you know, a, of that that flavor, which are a little slower. Like uh, I just watched the Suspiria remake a couple weeks ago uh-huh. and loved your podcast on those on those uh, three movies and, and had never watched all three of them and didn't realize that they were connected like by by uh, architecture and, you know, some of the other stuff. So it's like, that was, that was re- some of the Argento stuff that you did was really interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm going to do a follow up episode to it. So cool. What did you think of the Suspiria remake? Um, I loved it. I loved how they didn't try to remake it that they, that's true. Yeah, they did. They, I watched the extras and they, they really said they wanted a different color scheme and they wanted a different architecture in the school. But they weren't trying to, you know, do a shot for shot. And I really liked that. And I liked how Susie had more power. Susie had yeah. more of a voice. She wasn't she just a mouse. Did. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I loved Tilda Swinton. Did you know that the psychiatrist? She was, she was the old man. <laughs> she was the old man. She was deaf. And she was uh. also, she was, she was basically every main character. She was the old man. She was deaf. And she was um, Mater Superiorum. Tilda Swinton is a national treasure. That's amazing. <laughs> she, yeah, she's absolutely amazing. So, um, so you would um, pick one of the Jalos then? Um, as as my favorite slasher, I mean, you can go. Th- that's just what I've been watching recently. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, man, I'm just tr- trying to think of, of some of them because there there are a few and they're all kind of jamming in the doorway all at once, and I yeah. can't, can't get you know can't yeah. get to, can't get them out. Um, the, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in the phase now I've got a 15 year old daughter and we're going through some stuff. And so I showed her Halloween, you know, not all that long ago, mm-hmm. um, thought that that movie is, is damn near perfect. I'm a, yeah, I'm a, is. I'm a John Carpenter guy anyway. Yeah. So, you know, big trouble in little China is kind of my go-to when I get the flu, you yeah, know? So I yeah. mean, it's <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> one of those kind of things. Um, I, I love some of the, some of the older stuff that, that is just like on the line of, of too far, but on the other side of it, I mean, the, the perfect example of that is like the first Texas Chainsaw Massacre, yeah. you know, where, where basically a guy's out there. He's yes, sure. It's 106, put on this meat suit and get out there. You know, I mean, yeah. I, I kind of uh, appreciate the, the stick to but also the, uh, just the, the aesthetic that it creates, you know, and, and, uh, yeah, we're going through some old ones right now and I'm just rediscovering a lot of these horror movies. Uh, we watched Poltergeist last week, you know, it's oh, like that yeah. movie is amazing. Oh so, yeah. 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 I'm not answering, I'm talking around your question, but yeah, the, the, just, just, I just love watching some of those again. They're great. Yeah. I have to ask since you mentioned Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Yeah. If I'm the only weirdo that sees the ending of Texas Chainsaw when, she gets away when he's whirling his chainsaw around. If, yeah. If I see that as a temper tantrum, like a child yep. having a temper tantrum. Yeah, I, I think that that's not that was exactly how I read it. Just okay. Because he's he's freaking out because he doesn't. Yeah, he's he's very upset. Did Did you see the thing the other day about how Midsummer and Texas Chainsaw Massacre are the same movie? I think it was written by Phil Nobile Jr. from uh, Fangoria. If you can look it up, it's a really funny um, side-by-side comparison about how they both end with uh, dances and... <laughs> no! Uh, no, but... Look, look, look that up. You'll have a good, you'll have a good 10-minute read. Okay, yeah, but I had read, um, I think it was Dread Central, that said that it was um, the, the Wicker Man and Texas Chainsaw Master. That was like the two of them meet. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's not bad. I'm, I'm, I'm actually, you know, if you've ever seen the, the original Wicker Man with Christopher Lee, that movie is creepy. Oh, it's, I love it. It's a good movie. And then, you know, Nicolas Cage comes in and starts punching old ladies and wearing bear suits. I'm like, okay, that didn't work nearly as well. I can't even, I can't even watch that version. I just, it's, it's Nicolas Cage. I can't, <laughs> I can't. <laughs> I don't know. You get me in the right mood. I can catch a Nicolas Cage movie, but man, oh man. It just feels disrespectful to Christopher Lee. <laughs> yep. I agree. 
<laughs> and Christopher Lee, that dude, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Well, you need cool. to go. You need to go. I do. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for for uh, supporting the work in general. I, I mean, it, it's I'm I'm just a guy in the middle of Nebraska writing books, and, and it's great to make a connection with another you know with another horror fan, and, and oh, it's been absolutely. a pleasure. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I really really appreciate it. Yep, absolutely, and I'll uh, I'll be listening. So thank you. All right, and I'll hook you up with Jeff Strand. All right. <laughs> hey, hey, you know what? I, I've, I'm three books into his into his uh, into his uh, uh, bibliography right now. So yeah, I'd love to love to butt heads. That'd be great. You got it. All cool. Right, thank thanks, you, Mike. All right, bye. bye. As promised, here are the synopses for Mike's novels. Fantastic Land. Since the 1970s, Fantastic Land has been the theme park where fun is guaranteed. But when a hurricane ravages the Florida coast and it isolates the park, the employees find it anything but fun. Five weeks later, the authorities who rescue the survivors encounter a scene of horror, and photos soon emerge online, breaking records for hits, views, likes, clicks, and shares. How could a group of survivors, mostly teenagers, commit such terrible acts. Presented as a fact-finding investigation and a series of first-person interviews, Fantastic Land pieces together the grisly series of events. Park policy was that the mostly college-age employees surrender their electronic devices to preserve the authenticity of the Fantastic Land experience. Cut off from the world and left on their own, the teenagers soon form rival tribes who viciously compete for food, medicine, social dominance, and even human flesh. If meticulously curated online personas can replace private identities, what takes over when those constructs are lost? Fantastic Land is a modern take on Lord of the Flies meets Battle Royale that probes the consequences of a social civilization built online. Mike wrote Fantastic Land in 2016 and followed it up with Pack in 2018. You heard me ask him about Pack's title in the interview. It was erroneously listed as a pack in Goodreads, and after I cleared it with Mike, I fixed it. It's titled Pack. Here's its synopsis. Cherry, Nebraska, population 312, is just off the highway between the sticks and the boonies. It's where Dave Rhodes and his friends have lived all their lives. They own businesses, raise families, pay taxes, deal with odd neighbors, and once or twice a month, just like their fathers before them, transform into wolves. It's not a bad life, but when one of the group members goes astray, it sets in motion a series of events that will threaten to destroy the delicate balance that has kept Dave and his clan off the radar. Between his son getting ready for his first transformation, called the Scratch, a wife with sordid secrets, a new sheriff who knows nothing of the creatures in his midst, and a mysterious man in a bow tie with a shady agenda, the middle of nowhere is about to get very dangerous. Thank you for listening as always. I love you guys. You can follow both There Might Be Cupcakes and Mike Bakoven on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Our social media links are in the show notes. Coming up next on, in episode 53, the promised second episode on Dario Argento's Three Mother series and the Suspiria remake, a deeper dive into the symbolism inherent in the series, and on architecture as spell work, sleep and dreams as spell work, drugs as spell work, and what these films and Snow White, their original inspiration, have to say about motherhood and witchcraft. Until then, sweet dreams, and remember, it's hurricane season. Take your bug out bag to work with you every day, and keep a close eye on your coworkers at all times. <laughs>